situations of severe uncertainty are ones in which, because of limitations of some kind, possibly limitations in the information or evidence that we hold, or limits in our ability to process it, or perhaps even limits in our ability to conceive of various possibilities, we are unable to identify in an exact way what possible contingencies we face, and of those that we know that we face to give precise value to how probable or likely they are. Current economic theory has a great deal of difficulty in dealing with decisions that have to be made under those kinds of situations. And the reason essentially is that twofold. Firstly, that standard economic theory assumes that we have, uh, we start with uh, an understanding of what all the relevant possibilities are. In short, that we know what all the, what all the unknowns are, even if we can't say precisely what value to attach them. And secondly, standard economic theory assumes that once we have a, such a list of the possible, uh, possible contingencies, that we're able one way or another to arrive at a very precise value for its probability or in the case where we're thinking about consequences for its utility. And only when we're in that kind of position does sort of standard expected utility theory begin to do its work. Yeah, it has enormous practical implications for the simple reason that there are many, many policy problems that we face, both as individuals but also as, as societies, that uh, arise in situations of severe uncertainty. So perhaps the most obvious pressing one is, uh, is the question of how to handle climate change. So in order to come up with uh, you know, efficient policies for dealing with the fact that our climate is changing, we need to have, we would like to have very specific projections about what's, what will happen to our climate over the medium to long term. But these kind of projections are almost impossible to achieve given the, the sorts of limitations that we, we face at the moment, in particular informational limitations. So we, nonetheless, we have to make policy decisions even under those situations, and they're clearly very important decisions to make, they're very high stakes decisions. So. Uh, arriving at some way of being able to rationally manage our limitations in these circumstances has very, very important implications. Well, I, I, I started out uh, studying the social sciences, I guess pr prominently economics, but also political science and sociology, and I just found that um, you know, my interests lay on the theoretical end of all of these disciplines. Maybe it was a certain kind of laziness for the empirical, experimental work. And then there's a sort of very natural path, the sort of the more foundational you go in these disciplines, the more and more you come into contact with philosophy. Um, I ended up doing a one-year master's degree at the, at the London School of Economics as a kind of way of doing a bit of philosophy that I thought would be relevant to at what at that stage was going to be a career in social science and kind of got bitten by the bug. I mean, uh, you know, I realized there were a whole lot of philosophical questions that were interesting, many of which had very little to do with the sort of social sciences, but which I uh, wanted to pursue further. So I, you know, there was no sort of decision point, but there was a gradual shifting out of sort of narrow social scientific interests into sort of broader philosophical ones. Yeah, the, I, I mean, my work, I think, has been most directly influenced by the work of uh, Richard Jeffrey, the decision theorist, who, who was at Princeton, uh, not at Chicago, where I did my PhD. But I, I'd always studied decision theory. I, I mean, I, my first encounter with decision theory was really in economics. And uh, I sort of discovered through his work that there was a different way of approaching the same question. So uh, Richard Jeffrey is not a philosopher of economics. I think he's really a broader philosopher of science, but much of what he... Uh, much of what he studied is directly relevant to uh, the kinds of treatments of uncertainty that you find in standard economic theory. And I, you know, I, by, by sort of looking carefully at his work, I realized that there were ways of uh, more or less sort of modeling the same phenomenon that was, uh, uh, same phenomena that was in broadly the same spirit, but which offered, you know, both clarity and rigor uh, of a kind that one didn't find in the standard economic treatments of it. So, I, you know, the rest of my life, I think, I've been, in some sense, you know, carrying out a kind of program that, that uh, Richard Jeffrey began for reconceptualizing our understanding of uncertainty. 
So I, I think it's clear what, that at the moment the, 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 very, the, the very hot topic is how to understand uh, what's often called ambiguity. So this is perhaps what, you know, part of what uh, one might put under the parcel of severe uh, treatment of severe uncertainty. So specifically, uh, ambiguity is, uh, situ situations of ambiguity are ones in which one can't attach precise probability values to the, the states of the world. And there are a number of um, you know, different rival theories out there at the moment as to how one can better measure and represent ambiguity. And then even more, an even greater plethora of different models about what, what to do from a decision-making point of view once you have such a representation. So we're at that sort of stage which philosophers really like and why I think this will become a, a very, is becoming and will be, become even more so in the future a hot topic is that it's a sort of a mess at the moment. So it's a perfect time for Sort of people who are trained to think through carefully, to sort of analyze out implications and so on, to get involved in the debate, see what's at stake, try and make the concepts clearer, and eventually sort of you know, provide this kind of productive impetus towards at least a consensus on the basic terminology and understanding of the phenomena. So I think that's one very important area. An area that has bubbled along for a long time, but I think will, you know, will increasingly become so, is trying to understand uh, you know, the role of deliberation and particularly um, the role of deliberation within groups in, uh, you know, developing policies, fostering institutions and so on. Uh, yeah, there's a sort of interesting uh, intersection here of work that's being done in game theory, work that's being done in the philosophy of language, work that's being done in the philosophy of probability. That's sort of, you know, I mean, I'm speaking as someone who works very much within a community where formal methods are, are often applied. And here, I think, we're finding methods from these different areas kind of getting applied to a, a topic that's of very broad interest. And I, I see people sort of, you know, doing more of this stuff in the, in, in the near future. Thank you.